so I'd like to say hello to everybody virtually. You all better have plenty of drinks too, nice water, and we can enjoy ourselves. Thank you for attending our panel. My name is Ed Benoit. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Life and Education and Science here in Louisiana at Louisiana State University. Go Tigers. I'm contractually obligated to say that every time. And I'll be moderating this wonderful panel today the way things are going to work, I'm going to start out by introducing everybody, rather than breaking up the flow of the panel as we move along. We'll have our three presentations, and then please hold all questions until the end, and we'll engage in a wonderful discussion. For those of you who have attended the past three AMIAs, is this the third or the fourth where we've been talking about this? This is the third. Okay, so the previous two AMIAs and this one. Uh, this is the third time that you might have heard about this, and this is an ongoing research group, research panel, development, and I'm really pleased to see how far we have come in just three years. And we're really looking forward to the next year as we start moving even further along. So let me begin by introducing our panelists. Uh, our first presentation will be by Karen Gracie who is an associate professor in the School of Library and Information Science at Kent State University. She is the author of Film Preservation, Competing Definitions of Value, Use, and Practice, and editor of Emerging Trends in Archival Science, which has now been published by Roman and Littlefield, on sale at your favorite bookstores. <laughs> Other recent publications include research on the connection between Hollywood and the Cleveland Public Library in the 1920s and 30s for library and information science history, the evolution of moving image preservation in cultural institutions for information culture 
a journal of history, and professional attitudes towards digital distribution of archival moving images for the American archivist. She also is deeply interested in developing pedagogical frameworks and competencies for moving image archival education, as you will soon hear. Our second presentation will be from, it will be a joint presentation with Janet Seha, who is an assistant professor of library and information science at Simmons College. Her research interests are in the fields of moving image preservation and cultural archives, and she teaches courses in the archives management concentration, as well as cultural heritage concentration. And Adam Schutzman, who has been working with audiovisual collections and archives for over six years, including positions at the Harvard University Archives, the Schlesinger Library and Bread and Puppet Theater. He currently works as the research assistant to Janet, hence the collaborative presentation, while completing a master's degree in the archives management track of the Library and Information Science program at Simmons College. He also serves as president of the EMEA student chapter at Simmons and is on the steering committee for the moving image and recorded uh, sound roundtable within New England archivists. He is obviously passionate about audiovisual preservation, but also community archives, oral history, as well as outreach. Our final presentation will be from Snowden Becker, who is the MLIS program manager in UCLA's Department of Information Studies and previously managed the interdepartmental MA degree program in moving image archival studies. She, she is the co-founder of the International Home Movie Day event and the nonprofit Center for Home Movies, and is currently completing her doctorate in information studies from the University of Texas at Austin. So thank you for attending, and at this time, I will hand it over to Karen to get us started. Thank you for the uh, great introduction of all of the panel members. Uh, I'm going first, and I will say I've been uh, begged to be succinct and speedy, so I will do my very best. Uh, so uh, this is a group that kind of came together a few years ago uh, around this idea that uh, you know, we are a very fast growing field and we've had a lot of changes in the last 10 to 15 years, and the growth of many educational programs. Uh, and one thing seemed to be missing that a lot of our allied fields and professions have, which is some sort of set of competencies or educational guidelines. And a lot of that has to do with how fast the field has moved and how the work has changed over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, so that was our task that um, we, you know, it's a pretty large task, was, was to think about ways to develop a set of competencies. Uh, and uh, in past presentations, I've talked about why we need the competency set and ways of approaching the, the development of one. And uh, so uh, I am not going to talk really about that today, except just to mention, you know, who would benefit from this. And then I'll get into, uh, you know, we've been working on some research projects directly related to the development of the competency guideline uh, sets and, or and or guidelines. So uh, just to very briefly talk about you know, who would benefit from an audiovisual archiving competency model. Uh, so we see four different potential uh, beneficiaries, the, you know, of course students and working professionals, educators, employers, and lastly certifying bodies and professional associations, which Amina you know, would be part of that. Uh, so uh, I apologize, I, it's a little light, but uh, this just provides a, it's an overview of things that would be useful that can emerge from competency sets. Uh, so for the students, uh, they get things like pathways to improvement and advancement, information on possible work environments and activities. Uh, they get grounded in the ethics and values of the profession. They get, of course, an overview of the knowledge domain of the profession, as well as potentially down the line some self-assessment tools about how they can grow as a professional by gaining more knowledge and skills. Then there are the educators who would finally have a, a set of not only competencies, but core competencies. So no matter what environment you go into, what are the main things that you need to know. Uh, and then, of course, we can fully flesh out specialization competencies uh, and uh, 
you know, as an educator, it would be nice to uh, look at applicants and say, you know, is this, does this person have an appropriate background or appropriate interest that would be a good match for this area? And, you know, several other types of teaching tools, pedagogical tools, like how do you um, evaluate somebody to see if they're competent in that particular competency. Uh, employers would then uh, be able to uh, use a tool that could uh, assess an applicant's a match to a position based on competencies. They could create feedback and assessment tools for things like annual reviews. And it would also help them map between their major job tasks and the competencies of the profession. And finally, certifying bodies and professional associations um, you know, we've had a lot of discussion over the last 20 years about, you know, should EMEA be certifying programs? Should we be certifying people? Uh, so, so this would actually be a step along the pathway if we chose to do that, and I'm not going to go into all of the political uh, stuff around that, but just to say it would be there for them. Okay, so this is uh, just a very quick um, illustration of, you, know, you can see the concentric circles of what I consider to be the knowledge and skills of the audiovisual archiving profession. And in the center you see foundational knowledge and moving out from there, specialized or uh, format specific or function specific knowledge, soft skills, which is something that we're very concerned about making sure is part of a competency set, and also the practical or on the job application of knowledge to real world environments. So we argue that graduate programs need to have all of those things uh, you know, to, so, so they're, they're balancing requ requirements for broad-based education and theoretical historical foundations of the profession with equally strong needs for specialized knowledge and skills relating to the formats and functions of our whole AB. Uh, so, so all four of these uh, things, along with the soft skills and the practical uh, on, the, on the job application, are important. Uh, so, one of the challenges with moving into archiving and preservation is it actually is very multidisciplinary and it draws from a number of different uh, disciplines and professions. So, that, that, that's part of the challenge. You know, most, uh, well, not all, some, you know, so we have programs that are within like LIS programs, we have some programs who are in uh, more as, uh, associated with media history. So, you know, what do we do? How do we approach this? How do we start to build a competency set when we're borrowing from all these different fields? So what I actually focused on in my, uh, in, in my part of the task was to look at existing competency sets and guidelines and uh, select publications where they're identifying, you know, what are the key things? So one of my first starting points was <laughs> Ray Edmondson, and Ray, you're in the audience somewhere, I don't know. Uh, I think he is. Um, <laughs> um, but so he, in um, an article, I'm sorry, not an article, a publication he did for UNESCO, the audiovisual archiving um, publication, he established these, what he called basic equipment for moving image archivists. And uh, so this, you know, this is you know, sort of setting that stage for, at a very high level, things that moving image archivists should know, should have a familiarity with. But, um, you know, clearly there are things that are, folks are doing in this field that probably would use this as a building point but expand out, particularly some of our specialists. So what I did for uh, data, and I'm sorry if it's really tiny, but essentially this is a list of all of the competency sets and guidelines that I analyzed for my part of this research project. Everything from the Academy of Certified Archivists, the American Alliance of Museums, Museum Curator Competencies, American Institute of Conservation had two sets of competencies, one for conservators and one for conser conservation technicians and collections care specialists. Uh, I also have things coming out of more of the, the library side, so the American Library Association core competencies of librarianship. And I also looked at um, three <coughs> core competencies for visual resource management, as well as special collections librarianship. Uh, there are a few others, there's some coming uh, oh, of course, the Society of American Archivists graduate programs and archival studies guidelines. So grabbed all of those PDFs and did uh, a content analysis to try to tag all of them and you know sort of see you know where where are the competencies and you know where are they overlapping. So um, went through 
uh, tagging process. So each topic or skill that was found in each document was tagged. Uh, then I grouped together those tags and merged categories as needed to combine similar topics and skills. So this goes across not just moving image archiving, but all of these LA fields. Uh, organizing them in a hierarchical fashion to basically group them together and identifying patterns across the disciplines to see how different allied fields share certain competencies uh, and competencies that are specific to particular fields. So, uh, added, so data analysis, uh, there were 322 initial nodes or tags generated. Uh, after the consolidation and organization process, um, I established 19 top level nodes and uh, so that's for these various allied cultural heritage professions, including archival science, audiovisual preservation and archiving, conservation, information science, librarianship, museology, special collections librarianship, and visual resources management. Okay, and so the, this is that uh, high level, set of high level um, competencies that I came up with after all of this grouping and organizing. Uh, and so I don't really have time to go through all of these. In fact, I'm looking over at Ed to see. I'm good. Wow, okay. I told you, I was I'm good. used to say. Um, but I just wanted to give you, an, uh, show you an example of what, what one of them looks like once you, you drill down into the hierarchy. So format knowledge. So some things may be a little bit overlapping, uh, but you know, things like archival material knowledge, basic media related physics and chemistry, the history of audiovisual production, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, terminology is interesting. It probably could be its own high level um, category in and of itself because it actually appears in more than one of these high level competencies. All right, so uh, the, I used the program in vivo and they have this nice feature where you can do uh, tree maps and I know it's a really tiny font, so I apologize. I haven't figured out yet how to tweak it to make those fonts bigger. But essentially, each one of those colored blocks represents um, the number of tags that were associated with those high-level categories. <coughs> so the one on the upper uh, left, preservation and conservation, management and administration, plus below that in blue. So the size of the box corresponds to the number of times I found that particular topic <coughs> or skill within uh, each one of those areas. So that's one way of looking at it. So you can see preservation and conservation is huge. Uh, communication, collaboration, and outreach just to the right of it is bigger. And so as we go along, oh, five minutes, I think I can do that. Uh, <laughs> you see there's, there's less and less. Um, there's also the, this is like looking at the nodes drawn from each set of competencies or guidelines. So the blue would be the Academy of Certified Archivists, uh, set of uh, knowledge areas. Blue, uh, the pink before, below that is special collections. Um, so I won't read all of them to you. I'm happy to share the slides, but you get a, an idea of basically how many nodes or topics. Uh, part of the issue is that the competency sets vary in, in terms of how detailed they are, too. So some of them are very high level aspirational, and some of them are get a little bit more granular. So, so it's not a perfect process, but it gives you a sense. Okay. So how do you go from something like this to usable competencies? Um, I think that um, Janet's probably going to touch upon this too, and perhaps Snowden as well. But um, one of the things that we really have to deal with is what I call levels of competence. Um, there are some of the competencies that I've looked at that actually say, you know, let's think about this in terms of beginner, intermediate, advanced, uh, and uh, but not all do that. And part of it is some of the professions think that we should all be at that professional level. Well, the reality is not all of us are, and we may have people working in our archives, our libraries, or museums who aren't quite at that point. So I, you know, I think it's worth looking at, you know, not just having a set of competencies, but ones that somehow matched to experience, expertise, depth of knowledge. So here you have a collection housing. This is from the AIC's requisite com competencies for conservation technicians and collections care specialists. So at task level one, they're able to do basic housing techniques. Two, you know, you know, it don't just go, it gets more and more, so there's four levels up to a conservator. So but you can see there's a pathway. People know how to build on knowledge and what they should learn more of, what they should get more experience doing. Okay, 
So, um, so the question is, should the field of AV archiving develop different levels of competence corresponding to basic, intermediate, or advanced uh, slash expert levels of knowledge and skill? And I would argue that we should. Uh, so limitations of this study, um, you know, one of the things that's kind of missing from this now is um, knowledge in the area of media histories and moving image and sound production. I think that I would need to dig a little deeper and see if there are any competencies or guidelines in those areas that could be added to flesh this out more. <coughs> I'm also looking at, in some cases, the guidelines that are over 10 years old and haven't been re redone recently, so there is that issue. This is why you can't rely solely on this. You have to look at more recent data, like job advertisements and uh, syllabi, uh, the, 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 which Janet is gonna tell you about in a second. Um, so we also need to validate. So we're, I think, in the process of um, you know, looking at at least three data sources and trying to pull these together into a larger set. And then we go and we talk to all of you, we talk to instructors, we talk to employers, we talk to current and recently graduate students in the field to make sure that we are up to date and we have captured what the, the professionals need to know in this field. Okay, so next steps are to fill in those gaps and, uh, and you know, basically use the, the feedback through interviewing and focus groups. Uh, and that way we'll be able to establish what are core competencies and what are specialized knowledge area competencies and hopefully establish levels of competencies. And I believe that I am done. <laughs> syllabi from 12 institutions across the U.S. and Canada, and today we're going to present our findings. This is just a presentation of our outline, a, a outline of our presentation. All right, so like I said, our project goal was really to identify competencies embedded across uh, different sectors. <coughs> The research question that guided our work was what core competencies are embedded in a curriculum in the U.S. and Canada? And as a quick definition, competencies are skills and knowledge that are valued across an academic program or a specific profession. They're meant to align learning outcomes for courses to a larger set of expectations, whether those expectations are for a specific LIS program or a cinema studies program, uh, to educational guidelines that are developed for a field or a profession. In our study, we define knowledge as a body of theoretical information about AV archiving. Skills were defined as proficiencies that are gained to perform an activity, and abilities, in this case, equate to the quality of being able to do something. For the analysis, we combine skills and activities because students come into the classroom already having very specific abilities that are leveraged to help shape skill sets or to form skill sets. So take for instance how students come into the classroom you know, ready to engage in discussion, but they may only be able to engage in discussion at a low level, and it's the content and knowledge that they learn during the classroom experience that they're able to have more sophisticated discussions, say, about the identification of formats. So this is one of the reasons why it was important for us to combine skills and abilities <coughs> in our analysis, but also because in syllabi, and the way syllabi tend to be constructed, you oftentimes see phrases such as, by the end of this course, students will X, Y. <laughs> so essentially, skills and abilities are combined in that formulaic framing. And Adam will be guiding you through the process of that we went through for the method. So to begin with, 
Um, we conducted an extensive syllabi survey of every known audiovisual archiving course found in the United States and Canada uh, in order to start identifying audiovisual competencies. The survey began in fall of 2016 with the intention of finding the most up-to-date versions of each course. Um, syllabi were found by directly contacting professors of moving image archiving courses, um, by utilizing data previously collected by the working group, and by scouring the internet. Um, <coughs> courses that focused on audio archiving or that were only partially about audiovisual materials were not put into were put into their own category and not included in the final analysis. Um, anecdotally, we found four audio archiving courses spread across three institutions during the survey. After conducting the survey and collecting all known uh, audiovisual archiving syllabi, we began coding them using the constant comparison method and looked for knowledge, skills, and abilities in the course learning objectives. We also identified and docu documented the most commonly assigned literature and assignment types for these courses. After, co after coding and extracting data from the syllabi, we began analyzing the results. This presentation represents the unveiling of our initial analysis. So through our survey, we tracked down 15 syllabi across 12 institutions. Um, the syllabi range and date from 2010 to 2016, with the bulk of them being from 2016. Um, 13 of the syllabi came from ALA certified LAS programs. Uh, two syllabi came from the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program at NYU. Um, four of the courses were based online, and two of the courses were special topics that were not officially in the course catalogs. So putting some of the syllabi data, data that we gathered in context within the greater LIS and archives education community, uh, we found that only 24% of archives focused, uh, archives focused graduate, graduate programs in the US and Canada have some kind of moving image archive training in them. And only 18% of ALA certified LIS graduate programs have moving image archive training in them. So next we'll talk about the uh, competencies and the knowledge of those abilities. Yeah, so <coughs> these are the shared competencies, the strongest ones that we found uh, in the course syllabi. And I'm going to run through what some of these categories mean. Uh, so starting with the knowledge uh, column there, and remember, knowledge is defined as that theoretical information, right, that's introduced in the classroom. So preservation was uh, really central to, to learning objectives, and this encompasses preservation needs and challenges of audiovisual media formats and recording technologies, knowledge of preserva preservation vocabulary, which fits with what we were talking about, Karen, uh, standards, best practices, workflows, digital preservation, as well as identifying major players in audiovisual preservation. Archiving came second, and here we can think about archiving as a category that would describe appraisal, uh, description, handling techniques, knowledge of archival vocabulary, and very specific vocabulary, collection development, and appraisal. Under the history category, there's the history of audiovisual media formats and recording technologies, audiovisual archives, as well as history of audiovisual collections in libraries and archives. And sometimes those distinctions are, are clearly made. With access, we can think about you know, the presentation of audiovisual media as well as its reuse, <coughs> policies and procedures, and things of the sort. For institutional contexts, where audiovisual media are housed, where audiovisual specialists work. In terms of abilities, assessment was number one, and alongside that was identification of formats. There's also description and metadata, digitization, AV handling techniques such as inspections, and discussions were really big as well, in specifically stated in learning outcomes. In terms of assignments, we, uh, as Anna mentioned, we pulled and quantified information that was then classified. And what we found was that Presentations were big, almost, I think every single syllabus had a, a presentation that was assigned and graded. Reports, formal reports as well as informal reports were oftentimes assigned. That was the second largest type of assignment. 
hands-on archiving activities, discussions, again, quite big, and research papers and projects were last, but still stood quite strong. So in terms of um, shared course readings uh, through our survey, uh, we also identified and ranked the most commonly assigned literature for the 15 courses that we looked at. Um, on this slide, you can see a ranked list of the top five most common course readings. By far, the most commonly assigned reading was the Film Preservation Guide, published by the National Film Preservation Foundation, uh, which was assigned by 12 out of the 15 courses that we looked at. Uh, one thing that we observed overall was that the majority of the shared assigned readings were focused specifically on motion picture film and preservation. Um, so, uh, in terms of observations, um, some of our most prominent observations after looking um, over all the syllabi um, was that there is a serious lack of audiovisual archive training in LAS programs, especially given the critical situation that archives now face with magnetic media and other endangered formats. Um, the numbers being, again, only 18% of ALA certified LAS graduate programs having moving image archive training in them. Also, uh, the distribution of courses uh, is very geographically uneven, with most being centered in the northeastern and midwestern regions of the United States, thus preventing access to this training. Um, Additionally, uh, audiovisual archiving is a global phenomenon, and increasingly students are coming to LAS from other parts of the world. So going beyond US and European institutional contexts is imperative. Um, this point also connects to our observations around curriculum content. Um, so in terms of syllabi content, our observations include there being a, a strong overall knowledge emphasis on preservation, um, a strong skills and abilities emphasis on identification and assessment, uh, that written and oral based assignments are clearly dominating the coursework, and assigned course readings tend to focus on motion picture film and preservation. And just the final conclusions, uh, with this mini-study, uh, what it's helped us do is really begin to understand what those prominent competencies are in courses that are taught by instructors in the US and Canada, uh, but it leaves us with more questions. Uh, I think that there's an opportunity here to develop formal, flexible competencies uh, to encourage AV archiving education and provide you know, important guidelines for those who are interested in participating in this um, project. Also, <coughs> how can we develop a curriculum that continues to value preservation concerns, but that also goes beyond them, whether it's by engaging you know, with preservation context outside of the US and Europe, uh, or leveraging different archival functions, such as advocacy and outreach. Not one syllabus focused on this, this function as a student learning objective. And perhaps it's because you know there are classes on advocacy or outreach in programs, uh, but in some cases there may not be. Also, how can we really innovate pedagogically in introductory courses that are sometimes the only courses that are taught in the curriculum? What opportunities are there with distance education? Right, with different areas, um, interdisciplinary areas, and how do we how do we work on that? Finally, besides addressing preservation, the history, technical, and applied aspects of AV archiving, how do we um, introduce you know social, political, or economic dimensions in moving image archives? You know, are these topics that go and address in the classroom? And this links to a potential limitation in our study which is the fact that what's represented in the learning outcomes isn't necessarily going to represent what happens in the classroom, right? So you may be having discussions um, political, of on political issues concerning AV archiving, but that's just not represented in the learning outcomes. Um, other limitations include, you know, as Karen mentioned, syllabi, some syllabi are more outdated, and courses may no longer be taught because some were special topics courses. Also, our perspective is, um, or what we've captured here is really from instructors who design courses, and we're not talking to students about this, which is you know, another important factor to, to incorporate into to the study. So that's it. Thank you.
so uh, uh, I'll expand the acronym GLAM, Galleries, Libraries, Archives, Museums, um, for those who don't know. And this, this <coughs> session is about core competencies, um, specifically for the heritage sector, but I want to discuss the fact that competencies are useful for us as a field, regardless of where we expect our graduates and people with these skills to work. And I'd like to frame this with a story um, I had lunch a few months ago with a, a senior colleague whom I shall not name, um, uh, but who's very well known to all of you. And <laughs> in addition, we were catching up and, and trading archival gossip and talking about what we had each been working on lately. And in my case, that was um, <coughs> shepherding the UCLA program from a an interdepartmental. <coughs> Um, degree programs, a specialized MA um, that was had one foot in the cinema and media studies um, uh, component of our uh, School of Theater, Film, and Television's Department of Film, Television, and Digital Media, and the other foot in uh, the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies uh, Department of Information Studies and our MIS program. Um, to something much less uh, uh, unwieldy, um, which is a specialization track in our ALA accredited MLIS degree program, and the we discussed the changes in curriculum that had that had come with that from a six course MIAS core um, plus two FTV electives plus a required FTV course plus two required MLIS um, uh, seminars. Um, to a four-course MLIS core curriculum and as many electives as they care to take and internships um, from our department in information studies um, and across the university's offerings. Um, with the obvious emphasis being on audiovisual materials um, and heritage uh, preservation courses. Um, the, but there is no requirement um, that students take any particular set of courses to be part of this specialization. Our specialization pathways are descriptive and not prescriptive. So students are free to focus their own education in the ways that will be most supportive of their development of skills um, and establishment of a professional identity that's unique and contributes in meaningful ways to the field um, and, and sets them up well for professional success, whatever pathway they choose um, after school. The colleague declared, there's nothing that sets this part apart from any other MLIS program, is what you're telling me. I would not consider somebody qualified to work in a film archive just on the strength of that MLIS degree if they didn't have a specialized degree. I will leave aside for a moment the fact that I have just an MLIS degree <laughs> and seem to be doing fine. <laughs> I, I will also leave aside for a moment the fact that this person has, in fact, hired people with just an MLIS degree <laughs> to work for them at their institution. Those people are there now. I, um, I, I would like to focus instead on um, and consider what this says about how quickly we've come to rely on specialized graduate degree programs that are very new in our field as proxies for essential professional preparation. And I want to think about how we might establish equivalencies between people with specialized degrees, people with extensive experience in professional practice but no actual academic credentials, people with a combination of formal academic training, continuing education, dedicated self-study, internships, volunteer experience, or personal activities such as collecting and preservation outside of an institutional context. And I want us to think about what competencies we might be implicitly requiring of our practitioners and students um, and emerging professionals in terms of professional self-presentation selling your skills as applicable, sufficient, marketable, useful. So I think we should also entertain the question in the context of this discussion of extensibility. The idea that if someone with just an MLIS degree or another credential isn't qualified to work in a film archive, 
Where else might they expect to put those skills <coughs> to work? Conversely, if someone is qualified to work in a media archive, is that the only place where they can work? I think that we are looking outside the field and inside the field at all of these considerations. Things like certification of programs or organizations, testing, demonstration of competency <coughs> in different ways. Um, we can acquire and build these skills in many, many different ways. And I think that it's to our benefit to think about not just cultural heritage preservation as being where we work. <coughs> So I think that we need to reflect professionally and as a field on how we present ourselves, as Jenna was saying, advocacy um, for our institutions and collections is critical for us, but we also need to demonstrate our relevance to the broader world of which we are a part. I don't think that's difficult to do. When you look at the news every night, there are moving images and sound recordings. Um, uh, as Hollywood tapes, body <laughs> cam video. These are shaping our cultural conversation. They are part of the moment, but they are part of our history as it's being written now. Preserving those recordings and records is crucial to understanding this time as we have lived it. Um, and, and we can and should be thinking about production context and modes of delivery. Um, and selling ourselves as being valuable, not just in you know, sweet little small town historical societies and um, studio archives, um, but, but throughout society, in civic structures and in public and private agencies, um, and at individual and community and family levels. So I'm, I'm indebted, I know we have representatives from NEDCC here, and I'm indebted to them for posting a preservation engineer job description in August 2017 that really demonstrated an opportunity to compare core competencies from another field um, outside the heritage sector with one that is inside the heritage sector. So the, and I will refer you all to um, Ed's wonderful work about um, job descriptions. I, I was inspired by it and worked on looking at these. So I looked at the scientific working group on digital evidences for competencies for forensic, for forensic audio practitioners, fresh, freshly released in the, in the second version in July 2017. So just a few weeks before this job was posted, you know, law enforcement agencies and officials that deal with um, forensic audio examination and, um, and manipulation were posting what they consider to be the core requirements for professionals in this field. There were many similarities, and I apologize for the small type here, I'm happy to show you the slides, um, but who, who can say in all of these similar pairs um, of, of criteria which was the heritage sector job and which is the law enforcement sector job. It's, it's very difficult to say. In many cases, they're almost verbatim um, identical. The, the individual, um, the, the non-paired um, sections, again, it's, it's not really easy to say who is going to ask someone to strictly follow quality control procedures. We all do this recovering and interpreting metadata from file formats, identifying physical damage which may impact the proper function of the media or device. These are all the sorts of things that came up in the knowledge, skills, and abilities that were identified in, um, in library and information science curricula, and they're defined as being essential skills for jobs in the heritage sector and outside of it. So the ones in red um, are the, um, are the, 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 <laughs> 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 that are the NEDCC job. Um, the ones in black are the law enforcement um, core competencies for forensic audio um, practitioners. So, you know, if you were guessing or playing along at home, um, I hope you scored 100%, but I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't. And so I think it's really important for us to think about these things as part of our project of mapping our world through competencies. Oops, sorry. Um, you have a very sensitive touchpad. We 
delineate boundaries with maps. We also indicate how to get from one place to another. We show the pathways that connect places of interest, and we guide others' steps with these things. So our competencies that we define for our field can make it clearer where the essential and the desired skills in any different domain might coincide, where you have a, you know, a critical mass of, of, of essential skills but might need to acquire some stuff on the fringes in order to jump the tracks um, and, to, and to move from one domain into another. It may help us more concisely describe the jobs that we do or identify areas of shared interest and concern, thereby recruiting allies or, um, or encouraging others to collaborate with us on those areas of shared interest and concern. They're incredibly important. It helps us not just teach, but also learn. And I think that with that, we'd like to learn from all of you what you have to say and what you have to contribute. So thanks. So with that, we have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, because we are being live streamed and we are also being recorded, I'm going to move the mic over here to the panel and I would ask the panel to please repeat the question into the mic for, you know, preservation sake. Um, and so everybody can hear the questions. Who would like to be first? Oh, yeah, that's one Go um, ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So um, there has been very little, I feel, very little mention here of some kind of elephants in the room. Um, uh, one being that what is a moving image archivist? Uh, the kind of things that we are training people for. If you look at the organization, there are uh, people who work in uh, film to film laboratories who have a certain set of competencies they need. There are people who just do cataloging. That is a very a completely different set of competencies. There are people who work in museums as conservators. Are those part of the equation, time-based media conservators, or not? Uh, there's a whole lot of things. And I, I think one of the implications of that <coughs> is that any competencies have to be kind of pick and choose. And, you know, there's maybe we have all of these competencies, but some types of jobs uh, and some types of training go for certain ones and some for others. Related to that, kind of on the other side, is programmatically, um, I would expect that an archival science program is training people about collection level uh, type of arrangement, which virtually no television or film archive uh, follows. So, you know, there, there, there's all these kind of overriding things uh, that, that implicate any movement on competencies. Could we talk a little bit about those? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Howard, would you like to uh, maybe shrink that down into a couple sentences? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So this begs the question, this discussion begs the question of what parts of the field, of, of a very diverse, broad field, where um, many people who do different things call themselves audiovisual archivists, if, if our goal is to certify or credential these people with, uh, or be able to evaluate people based on competencies, how do we, how do we differentiate between those, those different categories of practitioners that all fall under this big umbrella? I must admit, I'm a little perplexed by the question, Howard, because do, you don't think that every one of these allied professions has that same problem? Librarianship, how many specializations in librarianship 
are there with often very different competencies. So, you know, I don't think we were trying to skim over that so much as say, you know, is there a core set of knowledge that it doesn't matter what you're doing, you know, that can be sort of drawn out of that, but also recognize what the information is for some of those specializations, uh, like you said, a catalog or a metadata specialist, somebody who works in a laboratory. So, you know, give those specific pathways. But there's also the issue of you know, levels of competence. Uh, somebody who is working with moving images as a part of a larger you know, set of collections, is, you know, is they're probably not going, you know, they, they still need a general grounding, but you know, they're likely to call in an expert if it goes beyond what their particular knowledge uh, base is. So, so I'm, I'm not sure I don't quite get your point in that sense, because almost every single one of these disciplines has specializations within it with different knowledge bases. I, I think that there's a, a distinct difference. Uh, first of all, in librarianship, you have ALA, which has required a certain set of competencies for everyone who works in a library. Now, that's changed in the last uh, 10 years or so because ALA because the library science programs are training people for things outside the library. But there has always been an expectation that anyone who does reference is also has to know, know about cataloging and has to know about other things. Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened in moving image archives. Media. There is not that kind of insistence that everyone know about the major, all the major kind of job functions. So in well, that way, that's uh, I think it's a distinct. Well, I mean, I've, I've been intimately familiar with all of these competency sets of, over the last, uh, you know, few weeks. And, um, you know, they're able to, you know, the, the students in an LIS program don't take a cataloging class. They take a course in information organization. And I'm sorry, but, you know, I think that just about everybody should have some basic grounding in information organization. I don't care, you know, what program you're in. So I, you know, I guess you know this. We've done a lot of we're special, we're special, we're special for a really long time because we had to because we were making a case for separate programs and what makes us you know special. But the reality is, you know, even if you're not feeling not feeling glam, uh, <laughs> there. I mean, what this process has told me on a high level is there is a lot of overlap. Um, both Janet and Snowden brought up advocacy. That doesn't matter what field you're in, you need to learn about advocacy. You need to learn about outreach. So, I mean, that's part of this process is saying, you know, there are gonna be things that are gonna say, that's not core for us. That's a, that goes into a specialty. But there are certain things that are core, and I'm sorry, that are shared among all of these allied cultural heritage fields. So, anyway. I, I, I'd like to add a little bit my, but um, part of the reason for the UCLA program's transition was because we had a hard time coming to agreement with, um, with particularly our, our, our colleagues in um, media studies over what the, the fundamental vision for the program, whether we were training media scholars to partake of the archival turn in media and history and scholarship um, and do archives-based <laughs> research, or whether we were training archivists and um, information professionals to approach audiovisual materials as a unique form of information with critical needs and um, crucial affordances that were different from text and other forms of information. Um, part of the where those differences manifested was in uh, the courses that we were asking students to take. At that time, uh, at least a third of our incoming students were coming with an undergraduate in the or in some cases an MA, a uh, previous degree and or deep preparation in history, media history, cinema history, cinema studies, um, communications. So I will speak for myself, if not for all of my colleagues, when I say I think it's ridiculous to ask somebody like that to take, require them to graduate to take another course in the work of Alfred Hitchcock. Um, that's, that's useless to you when if your interest is in 
media related materials and documentation or costumes and props preservation when you could be using that course time and tuition money to study the history of costume instead um, or fashion design or just take a sewing class so that you understand the physical structure of the materials you're working with. Um, we couldn't reach agreement on that and we couldn't even get acknowledgement that some students are going to be different from one another and that we do have very different ways that we expect people to be able to perform professionally as media archivists. Um, whether they're working with motion picture materials or sound or radio collections or oral histories. Um, and so our wish was to, uh, to allow as much flexibility as possible for people to do that and to not presume that our work was going to be focused on cinema. Um, to, to see our, our world as being much bigger than that. And I think that what that means is, yes, we can make fewer assumptions about what anyone coming out of a degree program or other preparation in media archiving, what they will all know versus what they might learn. Um, and that's part of how we, differ I think that's good for us. I think it's how we differentiate our programs from one another um, and, and focus on areas of strength for each of us. Um, but also, you know, make recommendations to people about, hey, you know, you, you really aren't deep enough in this area and at a minimum you're going to have to know a little bit about cataloging or about nonprofit management or, um, you know, collect the history of collectors and collecting in the United States to be, you know, to be competitive. So we might, we, we don't have to define core competencies as a checklist that everyone must have every single thing on that list, but, you know, again, use them as maps um, and, and a way of self-reflection um, so we know where we might be falling short of, of an ideal. But they're, they're, they're recommendations, they're not requirements. And I, I think we have time for uh, a couple more questions and comments. Um, so I just want to... <laughs> Sorry, it's not enough. Enough. just be us. <laughs> Rosa, I know you had a question, oh, too. Sorry. Rosa Guy, I understand. I'm not sure it's really a question. Or comment. <laughs> yes. From the point of view of the employer, a person that's looking for the person that has the problem, competency, what we noticed recently is the people that have the uh, let's say intellectual knowledge but very little hands-on experience on the material that they're fine to get a job on so they know about film history they know how to you know the mechanics of the preserving digital whatever but you cannot preserve a film if you don't touch film. And even if, if you don't touch it English. yourself, <laughs> if you don't touch it yourself, but you send it to the lab to be done, you either have to pay a technician to do the job of fixing it up before it can be scanned. And the institutions don't have the money to pay the <coughs> to do that job. Or they do it for one project where there are thousands of projects waiting to be preserved. And we hunger for these people that want that job and have the, the knowledge and the understanding of the job, but don't have that handling experience. Well, I, I think I'm actually going to take a little bit. Yes. Sure. Shall I summarize? Go ahead and summarize. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the question was about um, psychomotor competencies and knowing how, about that last, last time. Knowing, no, knowing how to do um, and not just not just not just what to do, but how to do it, um, and having having you know good hands, as as first um, Sonny from Color Lab described one of my students who is now employed with you. So how do you do that, and how do we make that important, and what 
position does this leave employers with if we teach mostly theory and not practice? Okay. And, and the, the, I, I apologize, I'm going to face the microphone. Okay. So um, the way that this is a significant challenge for my program, which is 100% online. And not just with the audiovisual courses, but with all of the courses. How do you make sure you get that, that hands-on experience? And I, I've had a, a handful of very successful students who have listened to my advice. Uh, and then that's ensuring that they are engaged in the community, that they are um, completing internships, paid or unpaid, that they are volunteering, that they know where to find um, workshops to actually get that much more hands-on experience. Uh, within my program, I have 15 credits, which is only five classes to cover all of archives. And they may take only one preservation course, and I hope it's the audiovisual one, but it may not be. And the, if they know what they want to do, there's only so much that I can give to them. It, they have to take some sense of ownership of their own professional development. And I'm happy to help them find that and, and those opportunities, but they really need to develop those skills uh, in order to become employable. I had sort of one follow up comment to this. Um, you know, you look at, you know, think, thinking about a lot of the other professions and you know what the, what the education and training is, uh, and of course you go into areas like medicine, you know, where everything is very integrated, all the practical experience is very integrated, and they're they're you know scaffolding them over time, uh, and we're we're just you know we don't have programs that are that long. Uh, most of us, uh, so I'm, I'm in a situation as, as Ed in that sense. Uh, I, but I think, you know, it's like we, we don't want to get into a situation like the law profession where basically lawyers who've just finished their degrees have no idea how to be a lawyer. <laughs> and everything is learned in their first few years in their first job. And so, the, you know, there's, yeah, we're, this is indeed a, a gap that, you know, it's like, should we propose that there be something to fill that gap for people who you know, have got all that history and theory uh, in their heads, but have had nowhere to be able to practice it. Um, like food camps. Yeah, yeah, so you know, is, is there some way that, you know, of course it seems like it's going back to fee off summer schools, um, but you know, maybe that is, is a way of addressing some of that, is to have some sort of intensive um, training to supplement uh, formal education. Um, you know, I mean, I think Janet and, said curricular innovation was important for us. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll let the yeah, Jody, you have no chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can go. say something about this. You can add something add to it because no, uh, we can't. Uh, yeah. And Simmons, yeah. 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 what we've been doing is, uh, what I've been doing is working with the new student chapter to develop a workshop on film handling, and this is something can, that can be replicated if you train uh, undergrad students who can then teach other students, and it's reciprocal learning that can happen. So students, you know, Ed mentioned how students, you know, can take some level of responsibility. I think this is an opportunity where they both gain instruction um, experience, but also film handling experience. So, yeah. I'll just, you can have the last one. Okay, here. I'll just add really quickly, oh, I think you're totally right about the need for hands-on experience and one thing that um, we had some leftover money from the EMEA student chapter this past year and I was able to get permission to use it to buy some basic um, film handling uh, equipment uh, to build and also some um, video analog video equipment to build a video preservation workstation and a, um, a film uh, workbench. So uh, just even just for students to get some very basic just like first time hands on experience so that even if they don't go into like concentrating into this, they're not freaked out by these collections. Like a lot of archivists that are generalized often are that I meet. They just don't know what they don't know how to handle it, they don't know what to do. And so I'm really excited about trying to break that. And, and, and I'll just have the, the last word here. I actually dug uh, my entire lab like that out of university surplus. 
<laughs> stuff that was being thrown away by the athletic departments. Um, unfortunately, as so often happens with this panel, there is so much more to talk about and discuss, which is why I come to Portland. And we will continue. And we'll continue. Uh, if you or stay been, after, and we're happy to talk more about um, this. Um, I just wanted to say, if anybody is interested in potentially being uh, considered as a participant in future phases where we start actually interviewing all of you, uh, you know, please do let us know. Give <coughs> you me your card or your name and email, and I'll make sure that, that you are in the loop for the future. Uh, thank you once again for attending, and thank you to the panel.